Hello everyone, today we make a history of medieval Iceland as a very short introduction, as usual, for our uh, historical region series. We will, of course, just um, give a sort of overall sketch um, of this otherwise, yes, contained, uh, especially spatially, um, but still pretty dense history, um, considering the uniqueness of this um, countries, um, especially early uh, political and social organization. I already discussed this partly um, in the video about medieval Norway because of the obvious uh, connection, eventually the, the subjection properly to Norwegian rule. But looking at the individual perspective is, of course, uh, crucial. Uh, the island remained uh, for a long time uh, uninhabited. Right, this is the case of many other uh, and larger uh, islands around the world. Um, there are, of course, lots of hypotheses, theories regarding the uh, identification of Iceland with the uh, ancient Tula that the Hellenic geographer Puthas of Massalia um, mentions in the 4th century BC by the way. Um, it seems unlikely telling the truth, because uh, at least uh, the land is described as pretty florid and wealthy. At least this could be a trope and a, um, an archetype, right? Uh, considering that Iceland was, uh, as we will see now, um, truly more productive uh, uh, at the time than in the later Little Ice Age that brought to some contraction also the the end of um, the settlement in Greenland that was called uh, like this, in fact, because it, it, it was far largely fertile. But, of course, we're still talking about, you know, uh, pretty far north, and this time, of course, um, with this is very fragile agricultural uh, systems that, especially with cold, are not really uh, going to allow a particular development. So, Overall, as we will see now with the historical and archaeological information we get about the early settlement, right? Everything fits the, the pattern of a of an island that surely was known in ancient times, but that didn't witness a particular, uh, you know, settlement. Um, perhaps Puthus was talking about Norway, uh, the Faroe Islands, or Shetland. Uh, by the way, I made a video about the Kingdom of the Isles, if you're interested, just to see also the sort of, um, in fact, water bridges and land bridges um, uh, throughout, especially the, the Viking era, and how today we'll add a little, say, a uh, step to that as far as the Icelandic um, connection with, with the British Isles, uh, not just with Scandinavia is concerned, All right? Uh, we think that a northern Germanic people known as the Thaler or Thiller, uh, may had that was uh, inhabiting Upper Telemark in modern Norway uh, during the migration period in the Viking era may have, in fact, settled in Iceland, as we will see, uh, essentially as a fringe population within what was uh, essentially forming, uh, building up as properly the Kingdom of Norway, when Harald Fairhair, in fact, uh, you know, brought to a significant degree of uh, control of, this, of his own house. Um, in this, um, you know, across what in fact would become Norway's a wall, and um, Icelandic history is deeply connected with this because it seems, in fact, that it, its early uh, settlers were, especially the, in fact, the ones from Scandinavia, that is, they were not just from Norway, as we will see now. Many of them were also British, will and Irish, as we will see. Um, but there is a different dynamic here. But as far as the Scandinavians are concerned, most of these people were likely trying to escape this sort of centralizing, say, con power concentrating attempt from the uh, nascent uh, Norwegian monarch, right? Uh, and uh, the same goes, in fact, with Greenland um, that um, would have been called like this, not much because it was a Greenland, uh, agriculturally speaking, but because of Grenland, that is yet another uh, historical district in Telemark, and the southeast of Norway, uh, and this um, was uh, again also populated by the the Thaler, uh, and so this, broadly speaking, uh, can support the further the 
the, the connection with this particular uh, Scandinavian community and the early settlement in Iceland. We uh, do not know exactly, however, uh, this is lost into the, the mist of history and the ancient, in, in the ancient world for sure, uh, when the first humans settled there, aside from, say, mythology, uh, from all the various connections. I, I have some videos in store about the same sort of Atlantic mean People stop to, to, to Plato's mansion, and I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, as you know, but there is a lot actually around the thing, and many different religions would be interesting to analyze. Uh, in any case, we do have Roman currency from the 3rd century found in Iceland, right? We do not know actually whether this was brought at the time, or in later uh, in periods, such as the Viking era, uh, it would be strange, in fact, during the migration era, during the Viking era, to have uh, these hordes of Roman coins uh, m moving, right? Just because of the intrinsic value of the metal uh, across the straight net circuits. Uh, by the way, I made a video about the about uh, early Gaelic warfare, especially uh, the late antiquity migration era, uh, in which, I don't remember the title, but there is a Gaelic warfare playlist you can check out, where we, we do know, actually, that Roman, uh, Roman British fleets um, uh, did chase um, uh, Celto-Germanic pirates far north, and likely also up to places like Iceland. Um, that was definitely not uh, beyond the reach, of course, of those those guys. There is a sort of hidden, by, say, uh, uh, of a prior Viking era in that time, and that um, I, I, early Icelandic settlement is uh, a, a very strong possibility as p for pirates' nests, etc. Et um, we have uh, some, however, certainty about the presence of an Iberno Scottish mission, in fact connected with Ireland, with this Gaelic places just in the, in the following centuries, uh, the sixth, the seventh, uh, having settled Iceland before the arrival of the Norsemen. The Land Namabok, that is, as you know, the when um, I think it's pronounced very differently, like, like Lantnauma Pok or something like that, a Pok or something like that. Uh, but Lantnauma, this is just like land name, right? It's, it, it talks about the, the settlement, the, the seizure, basically, of um, of Iceland uh, during the, the 19th. Hence, Andrews will uh, see now that dates to the 12th, uh, by the way, um, tell, does tell us, in fact, the, the pre of the presence of Irish monks that were known as Papar uh, in the, in fact, Icelandic sagas, um, individuals who had basically moved uh, in this faraway remote edges of the world because of hermetic purposes. We explained in our Christian uh, history playlist what was the deal, especially in this time in history, in the research for this uh, hermitage. Um, and um, in a spiritual sense, and this again perfectly fits the, the the broader picture, right? It wasn't a major settlement; these were just small communities that had, uh, however, an important organization among each other and could also uh, move in different ways autonomously um, in uh, around right the the seas and as pagans and with this early history of monastic plundering etc would have scared uh, these monks that according to the same uh, account would have left behind uh, their own Gaelic books, bells, croziers um, and other items. Right. Um, the 12th century scholar Ari Thorgilson, uh, that is essentially Iceland's most prominent medieval chronicler, the same author of the even more important Islandingabok, right, so the, uh, the the saga of the Icelanders, the book of the Icelanders, um, is um, uh, reasserting this um, aspect of the, especially of the bells, um, associating them to the Irish monks that had been found as settlers by the, by the Norsemen. 
Uh, archaeologically speaking, we do not have any evidence of that. I mean, it would, it's not that strange. After all, again, it was probably a very scanty presence. Uh, and, uh, like, too much has been lost in the first place. Wouldn't be, it's not statistically strange. However, it is possible that the M Irish monks were not the only um, guiles that had settled in Iceland. In fact, around the same time of the Lantnava box, we do have some same Icelanders claiming descent from uh, a king of Ossory in southeast Ireland, Serbal Mac Dulenga, which uh, I'm definitely butchering in the uh, you know Gaelic pronunciation. Which, again, wouldn't be strange at all. Uh, I made a video about uh, hiberno Norse warfare, and as you understand there, things were pretty mixed, as we will see now also from the, the more famous sort of genetic um, reveals of, of modern Icelanders essentially being a product of mostly Norse men, but also, in fact, uh, Celts from Britain and Ireland, uh, that in part would turn out to be slaves taken by Vikings, but not all, right? There were Gaelic Vikings as well, and it's likely that some of these guys um, that, as you know, were originally also as Gaels, fundamentally, uh, you know, enemies of, of, the, of the invading Norse, right, in Ireland, had already done what essentially the Vikings would do later by moving. Right, keeping to move, as we've seen from the migration here across the sea and settling in, in Iceland. Just we do not have much other evidence for that, though. Um, the Islandingabok um, tells us that these Irish monks, known as the Papers, uh, moved, as we've seen, because uh, the Norsemen were pagan. And so um, this would have created uh, problems of, of different kind. Uh, and uh, the there is a possibility that this Berno Scottish mission was already um, connected at the time with uh, with the papacy, right? That was actually throughout all the early Middle Ages extremely clo and closely in contact with all these evangelization efforts, even uh, in the northernmost areas of Europe, and and thus this would you know may correspond to some sort of broader awareness about what was going on also from the Mediterranean and other regions uh, regarding uh, Iceland as well and its its settlement. Uh, it's also sure that there were of, of these set early settlers many were just there on their own right uh, hermitage was not merely a matter of um, say monastic organization where lots of people were just were going there just to, to leave but to uh, we cannot be in the in the mind of a ninth of a tenth, uh, or even earlier, by the way, northwestern European spiritually, right? Uh, say culturally, it would be uh, anthropologically one of the single most beautiful things to find out. But uh, it took really also a lot of sheer will just to want it to 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 travel right across the sea to, to reach such a after all wild uh, place. Uh, we do have archaeological evidence of a cabin in Afner, in southwestern Iceland, which, through carbon dating, tells us that was uh, abandoned, right? It's sometime between the end of the 8th and the end of the 9th century, so fairly early in time, um, and... Uh, this, uh, of course, adds up to what we already knew. There is a sort of um, uh, mythological, like, symbolical date that is 874, uh, that, like, is also, you know, a bit of symbol of Icelandic, you know, identity, etc. You know, there's dates that are fixed uh, in history just for the sake of, from this moment onward, something more relevant happened. But, of course, there were um, previous settlers from even the same places that the uh, you know, those communities would become majority in the same Iceland, right? As just a, a cabin, of course, we do not find too, too much else, right? But uh, someone was visually uh, there. Uh, it may have been part of the Irish mission, we do not know. Um, so according to the Land Namabok, uh, and this sense more uh, legendarily, uh, Iceland was... Say discovered by a Norse Viking 
name as Nat Dalt, right? Um, he um, was born in Agder, which is today's southern Norway, uh, and he was also one of the early settlers on the same Faroe Islands, uh, and uh, after Grimmon Kamban had firstly uh, settled there. Um, so th there were instances, like in this context of individuals that had arrived to these pla desolated places, had lost everything there because, say, of a, uh, of a freeze or something, or their cattle had not survived, but in spite of having lost everything, they still had the, the sheer will to power to say, well, you know what, I will come back there, because I think still I can make something out of it. And this is beautiful, right? If you look at, uh, generally speaking, Norse settlements, even as far as even much more traumatically savage places, such as the White Sea, etc., you know that somebody was there, uh, after all. Um, the, um, the, the first name that was given to Iceland uh, by Nadet that had arrived uh, basically on the east coast, like of course from, from, the, from the east, call, uh, was Snailand, that is to say Snowland, uh, and also another uh, Scandinavian, the Swedish um, sailor, Gartar Svaverson, um, accidentally ended up um, in the in the island, right? And uh, he called it Gartar's Holme, that is to say, literally his own islet, right? He named it as Gartar, like it was as basically as himself. Uh, this is interesting. He spent the winter at Usaik, that is in the northeast of Iceland. Um, the first true uh, intentional uh, sailing towards the island was uh, carried out by Rafna Floki Vilgar Tarson, who was the same guy I was mentioning before who lost everything during um, the, the frost. Uh, and he actually lost uh, his uh, one of his daughters in during during the sailing, but was uh, you know it tells you about the terrifying um, picture involved. He um, seems to have uh, sp settled in Bartarstrand, that is to say, um, in the northwest uh, of of Iceland. Um, and uh, the guy was struck by the fact that uh, even after, after such a harsh winter, the entirety of the island would turn out to be green in summer, right? Um, and this is what brought him essentially to believe that there was something to make out of this uh, discovery, right? And he uh, he's also the guy who basically came back to Norway um, and... Um, essentially informed of the, the opportunities that were rising from there. Now, this, this moment is important because you really have the beginning of the first permanent settlement in Iceland credited to Ingolf Arnarsson, uh, known in some sources also as Bjarnolfsson, uh, and his wife Halveig Frota Dotter. Um, he is the guy that, by settling in 874, sort of marks the beginning of, uh, say, ideally, uh, Icelandic uh, national history. Uh, it's the Land Namabok that informs us about the uh, carving by Ingolfur of the Öntfejusulur, that is to say, the high seat pillars, um, uh, were a pair of wooden poles placed on each side on the high seat um, would um, uh, just basically the place where the head of a household would have sat were established um, in uh, on the island and this um, was where he basically landed in fact there is also the famous uh, painting by Johann Peter Radzig that depicted this, the landing um, and uh, the the establishment of, of the pillars, quite symbolical 
like a sort of labyrinth right here. Ikmanebimus optima, just to uh, break a bit the Norse idyllium but with, with a Latin um, citation. But it's basically the same concept, uh, also considering the deep religious significance that revolved around these sentiments, the fact that there was a, a great control from the, especially in this more contained uh, expeditions, by the um, either the people at home or the, the community was large of the settlers was knowledge enough by some religious authorities that were attempting essentially nobody to take to seize too much power from which uh, others could have um, lost their own. The und vegisular was literally the consequence of a vow, right? It's not really like going on the moon in comparison, but I mean, crossing the sea from Norway to, to Iceland in the ninth century, doesn't matter how smart and skilled uh, the Norsemen at sea were, was still something like for people with some guts, right? And of course they ask for um, for divine protection uh, during the saints. So this was a way to, to thank, of course, uh, divine power through their, uh, through their virtue, by the way. Uh, but Ingolfor is important also because while sailing uh, eventually along the Icelandic coast, he finally settled during the same 874 on the southwestern peninsula known as Reykjaneskaji, founding the, um, uh, this, this, this new settlement and naming it Reykjavik, that as you know is essentially the, the capital of Iceland, um, from at least not necessarily this time, but it would become um, to this day, uh, which means smoke coal. By the way, you can imagine uh, the uh, the reason, at least famously enough, for the uh, geysers that you can find you know, emitting smoke, this geothermal steam, right? And seen as, of course, uh, you know, in there some sign of, uh, for, in this case, obscure forces from the underworld, but still being essentially tamed of these settlers, bold settlers. Um, Ingolf, uh, Ingolfor Arnarsson um, is, again, a bit the hero of the situation, as you understand, but he may have actually not been the first guy who permanently settled, who established a permanent uh, community in Iceland, right? Uh, we know, for example, of a crew member escaping uh, his master, uh, Garter Svaverson, named Natfari. Uh, and uh, we know that also from the Landnama book, Natari, uh, named by Land, uh, the, the Landnama book, which would have been uh, an escape of the crew of the aforementioned Garter Svaverson. Um, so while the latter came back to Norway, uh, this guy essentially escaped and settled there, and just we do not know much better, but he's a possible, uh, you know, known candidate for actually being the first uh, guy settling on the island. Um, as you understand, the Land Nama book is a bit like the, uh, the basis uh, for uh, the early Icelandic uh, settlement. Um, we're talking about 300 years later um, compared to the events, uh, but uh, there is some consistency after all. Reykjavik may have well been uh, founded around the 70s of, of the 19th century. And these guys were, again, the, this, the communities settling were relatively small, at least especially the first ones. Um, but still they were led by people who were somehow relevant in the, say, the Norwegian, in this case, context of the time. So the name would be Ikard. So even if these guys were definitely not the very first people who settled there um, for good, uh, they may have been properly, really, the, the early most important ones that were known in a fairly accurate way just to be remembered um, through the sagas um, as they were eventually written down. According to the Land Namabok, Ingolfor 
um, opened the. It, that's why he's so important. He opened the path essentially for the larger settlement of many more Norse chieftains. Um, this early, this, this, the, the, the settlement, as we will see, basically involved n numbers from, say, the, the thousands to the tens of thousands, which for Northern Europe at the time was not a small demic concentration, especially considering that most of them came from Norway, that, as you know, is, is pretty squeezed in the interland, right, um, against the sea, and so there aren't so many planes, and it's part of the reason why these, uh, if for whichever reason they they decided to settle, the they really needed more land, right? Um, these people came together with their clans, their slaves, uh, and they found Iceland to be suitable, in fact, for for settlement. They, again, I, I'm, we're not going to spend too much time explaining why the settlement may have occurred. It's obvious that. Uh, I mean, it, this, this is a bit like everybody throws um, throws out things like uh, the, the, the the climate change, uh, the global warming. So these people were um, surviving more as children. There wasn't enough food for everyone, so they began to move. But actually, like especially after m moments of demographic contraction, when you start re-expanding again, like just by will you 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 will expand that's mostly how humans also work so we will never fully know we don't have the numbers the quantity the evidence whatsoever to make uh, any accurate causal uh, effective connection like in, in this sense um, political reasons are the most likely uh, the aforementioned uh, Norwegian attempt of centralization brought many dissatisfied um, Norsemen to just move away in in protest, uh, uh, in spite being a sort of desperate move, because in general, as you know, the, the monarchy was the future of Scandinavia, not only, right, it would have been better to live, you know, under our affair here than, let's say, somewhere in Iceland in a consistent way, but um, this was again political groups operate in different uh, fashion because they have conflicts with one another. So you got to understand that it's not the the myth of you know the freedom of the wilderness. Uh, you know, this sense that the Scandinavians were even more inclined to it. This was present in every single religion. It was nothing specific there. Just it happened that the the, the region is just less sparsely populated. So obviously you will have a greater connection with nature in that way, but it has nothing to do essentially with um, this uh, this strongly political, military, and incredibly violent reasons for which these things happened. But it's also something that you rightly want to do um, for just starting a new life somewhere else. That's the actual point uh, of the story. And... Um, that's um, that's what happens in the next decades um, after the fatidic 874, right? And uh, archaeologically, we uh, this this matches like the beauty of history is that actually documentary sources are uh, really reliable, uh, contrary to what you know this deterministic materialistic. Uh, obsession of the last decades uh, really, really show, right? You you wouldn't know what happened in Iceland uh, better if you just relied on archaeological evidence, which does tell us that, in fact, it's in this decades more people settled there if you didn't have the Land Nama book actually telling you that. Uh, and that's how we go with history mostly, and the rest is essentially moral relativism. Um, so these are the, again, last decades of the 9th century. Uh, as we've seen Primarily, the communities were Norwegian, but we do find uh, 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 Scottish Bernian uh, presence. Uh, we do know also genetically that um, some of these Irish and Scots were actual slaves slash servants of Norse chiefs that had been essentially kidnapped during the Viking raids on the uh, on the British coast. Um, the um, the sagas of the Icelanders uh, uh, make it clear, by the way. Uh, and we cannot exclude, as we were saying before, that Norse Giles um, settled also with uh, 
a Scottish Bernian element that was really autonomous on its own, right? Even though they were essentially um, also freely marrying to each other, not just through a rape and deportation. Um, this, um, of course, means that there was a connection, also in a broader maritime political cultural sense, between Iceland and um, Ireland, Scotland, not just Norway. And this was obviously um, a logistical necessity. It was much easier just to, you know, stop on each this this various uh, lands to resupply and to make it safer than just going a straight line as the crow flies or seagull flies, uh, uh, you know, between the the two points uh, geographically. Um, again, we do not have better explanations why this started happening. It was a mix of factors in which we mainly see a political reason. That, of course, is intertwined, surely, with some, I don't know, agricultural dynamic, demographic issues, etc. But we just don't know about latter. We just see that Harold Fair here was uh, trying to, to, to centralize more. Right, uh, he reigned between 872 and 930, uh, and uh, you know this adds up to the political explanation, at least. As we've seen, the Land Nama book is not the only uh, source, uh, at least of, of an early date, uh, of the settlement in Iceland. We have Ari Thorgilson for mentioned uh, Islandinga book, which albeit sort of. Uh, scantier information in is first of all probably older but also more reliable right and we are told by this source that Iceland uh, was settled in the following 60 years so we are essentially this, this times before for 870 930 meaning that um, basically all the uh, say realistically arable land had been occupied Right, and that thus there wasn't much more room for other settlers, right? And uh, this is how essentially the, the, the country is filled um, and uh, organized, as we will see now, in what is known uh, as the Icelandic Commonwealth. The concept of Commonwealth stems from the Assembly Council. The, a proud Icelander would call it the actually the oldest uh, continuing. Um, existent parliament of the Althing, that is to say the Althing, um, and so the, the thing of all the uh, all the freemen, as we will see now, the, the represent the, the members were representing the various communities were the, the aristocracy, uh, the Götterthorsmen or Gothar, uh, that convened uh, uh, each summer at uh, this location is Thingvellir, uh, the site of, of the council uh, that was held there, in fact, until 1798. It tells you the, the force uh, of tradition. Since 1881, uh, the parliament has been uh, um, uh, shifted to Reykjavik, uh, where it still is, with, with the name of Althing. Uh, it's the, the parliament of Iceland. Uh, and um, the, the major say there, there were many similar councils in this regard but let's say that um, the fact that it was like comprehensive of the, of the entirety of Iceland as it was forming as a country and the fact that it basically did not have at least ideally an impositive nature an executive power basically but just like a, uh, a power of Laws amendation, dispute settling, and uh, juries uh, appointment for lawsuit judgment, etc., makes it also in at least some contemporary libertarian context like a symbol of this great freedom. And depending on you know which times and places uh, you are uh, reading, of course, at different times, of course, a, a national symbol for Iceland, and other sort of the, I made a video about the the German, uh, say the Germanic um, interpretation, history of this sort of Zondervag of um, essential egalitarian liberties, etc. Um, and um, 
again, there, it, it actually did have an executive power. Like, it did not make exception in this regard. What's the point of having a council where you discuss things, but, you know, basically this is not enforced. Of course, it mirrored the actual weakness of any capacity of centralization. Communities, like, this is true for other parts of Northern Europe. If you look at Finland, for example, the, it's a traditional... Um, Scandinavian settling peasantry was the, the, you see there was too few surplus to create some sort of centralized concentrated power right so and that would remain traditionally as a proof of freedom but in actual fact this means that, that of course there was a you know a, a very you know underdeveloped condition that did create problems as a matter of fact because in the best um, sort of Germano Norse tradition actually um, the there was a very a conservative aristocratic mentality for which of course the the Gothar were extremely jealous of their own progress but as chieftains right and so other people had uh, really not the same level of wealth and power and as we will see now the, the same commonwealth declined because of course uh, also Iceland began to develop to a consistent degree for which uh, a sort of a greater governmental capacity and also an outer one the, the Norwegian um, royal uh, was, you know, entering uh, the scene, right? Um, and but uh, it, it's obvious that it was just the the only way they could leave. Uh, these communities were largely autonomous, as they had been in Scandinavia, uh, and uh, they probably had politically and culturally this sense of well, we escaped uh, an, a centralizing attempt in, in Norway, but of course the the connections with the Norwegian monarchy were not cut at all. On the contrary, the most important Gothar, uh, think, think about the age of the Sturlungs, as we'll see now, uh, would remain pretty strong. And of course, there was a Norwegian uh, co-optation of the local elites just for governmental purposes. And this is a positive dynamic after all. Right. For the rest, there were lots of feuds. Uh, Icelandic warfare was contained numerically. We had, I don't think we have evidence of any battle exceeding 1,000 um, men per side, or even, uh, you know, uh, even coming particularly close to that. Um, but it, it was, of course, marked by one of the single most traumatically violent realities we can ever imagine. Of course, these were incredibly aggressive, um, you know, sort of mental, you know, environments in which uh, you, 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 control what, what you had seized and it was your merit and whoever came in the way there were lots of feuds uh, people massacring each other and s still preserving this order as much as every group w wouldn't sort of manage to overcome the other at least ideally um, but of course uh, together with the lack of surplus was also uh, uh, an incapacity of creating larger military uh, institutions and so larger forces and at the end of the day what for I mean um, there wasn't really much else where you could expand or, but th that effort you would have been uh, well well spent um, and naturally in, and in fact the, the the main sources that we have on Iceland at the time talk about these feuds right in the best um, sagas tradition it's all about basically uh, you know clanic uh, disputes, killing, you know, dynastic issues, incest at similia, right? But it's just, again, normal for the, the majority of pre industrial society, really, that we had documented also much more recent times. Um, this Commonwealth period, it, however, m m marks, as you understand, a high medieval uh, phase that was uh, essentially for the entire Europe one of substantial expansion. So this was the case for Iceland that uh, did have an important development, even of these institutional structures, uh, etc. From here you have further settlements, of course a much smaller uh, scale in Greenland. In eastern Canada you have the um, sagas of Eric the Red uh, or the Greenland one, uh, talking about this exploration, uh, exploits, mostly sort of an overall Norwegian Icelandic uh, story. And we will talk, if you like, about this uh, further expansion. 
for today we stick to, to Iceland as such. Um, naturally, at this point, one major step towards power concentration or general development and organization, disciplining and you know, rule was the uh, overall ethos belief that Norway was Christianizing and, and so Iceland, right? The settlers, the early settlers were predominantly pagans Aside from the monks, yes, there were some Vikings that were Christian, and there was nothing strange about that, also because they were both basically pagan and Christians at the same time. I made multiple videos uh, about this. Um, so, uh, the Norse believed in essentially the, the same uh, pagan imperial Catholic tradition. I mean, that people are disconcerted with. I, I I met I don't know with kids that are obsessed with the idea that it was sort of Norse paganism that it was sort of a um, you know categoristically rigid religion on its own that nobody else had. No, it was the same identical religion basically everybody had always had, and that now had to cope uh, with some with a feeling that is well emergent from the from the sources that admittedly were written down in Christian times but that were already highlighting throughout its their content the sense that in fact we we do meet uh millenaristically throughout the entire continent that is to say that fate basically had prevailed on men's uh power this is something that made multiple videos on um it's about sacral kingship uh, etc um, in other words, the, the most ancestral concept that fate was just the will of the hero slash ruler, like it could be Odin, right, in, in concept, was now, like at least uh, an hypothesis, uh, belonging to a heaven that was ever more distant from, from Earth, where humans had fallen to such a state that they couldn't quite even hope to save themselves, and so that they just hoped through, you know, their self-sacrificing combat to win... Uh, you know, a, a good place in the Valhalla and just waiting for the end of time, the Ragnarok, for, and w where, you know, that some Azer would have fallen and that the world, let's say, the, the Universal Order would have shattered and there was no guarantee that even victory would have been achieved. And this is basically what the same Christians, the Christians actually had a more positive um, concept um, theologically, just not much for the, the, in part also because of the Apollonian sort of Roman Hellenic vision. Uh, the, the Norse were, together with the Germanic peoples in general, were more aware of the sort of dark uh, reality of the world to the point you didn't have to lower the guard. Uh, and uh, But that they felt even more that, that sense of sin, right, of, of uh, poisoning of the, of, the, of, of the gold, of the, um, of the Asgard uh, being contaminated essentially by the lesser races and uh, all the heroes and in some bad way because they have screwed up at some point and everything is going to uh, quite uh, Jungianly, you know, coming back in an ever bigger way that eventually is going to destroy them. Um, so Christianity did fit well this new mode of feeling. Uh, as you know, m most of Scandinavia, in spite of the fact that, yes, this emerged from internal civil war, was essentially converted out of arms. I mean, never someone invaded Scandinavia and forced the, the, the locals, like, I don't know, had happened in Saxony, that, that had uh, to, to be com uh, converted to Christianity. It was largely a, an, a, an autochthonous necessity. Christianity had spread there from, I mean, since it had existed, arguably, in spite of the, the races, where, of course, the majority uh, of, of the Norse at this point were pagans, and they would just take Christianity just as a next sort of, at some point... Um, extra power or you know depending on the chthonic uh, influenced idea of sort of material security like uh, or superstition right the idea of okay let's add this to the but already witnessing that sense of distance from the ancient ideals that were something truly prehistorical especially in this case um, and um, the most striking thing about Iceland, I would say, um, is that it exemplifies beautifully uh, the rapid and peaceful Christianization of the Icelanders, local people, compared to actually a more violent process in the rest of 
the north. Um, there was basically no issue about this. There was a sort of smooth, gradual process of Christianization, but institutionally it happened within the span of two, three generations, and nothing went wrong with that. Nobody imposed that they, the Icelanders uh, Christianized themselves by keeping some, some, some practice uh, on their own. And the way it went, or at least as the story goes, uh, in 1000, in the year 1000, some say 999, anyway, um, there was um, actually the risk of, of a concrete civil war between the essentially two opposite uh, religious groups, to make a long story short, a sort of pro-Christian and pro-pagan. And the issue uniquely was important for, for, for the Icelanders as a whole, so much so that the Alpingi appointed one of the chieftains considered a very moderate and, uh, say, valid man, as it was just the traditional practice, uh, customary law, that is Leos Bethning Goldi Tarkelson. Um, there was actually the low speaker of the Alpine already um, from 985 to 1001 in order to decide the issue of religion by arbitration. And the guy, according to the story, spent one day and one night under a four cover reflecting on the issue. And he came up with a compromise, basically. He decided that Iceland should have converted to Christianity as a whole. Right? It, this is interesting because it shows surely that, that the Icelanders had a sense of themselves also in relation to an external world, namely Norway, um, and also, but also the rest of Europe. We know of Icelanders traveling as far as uh, Rome, the Holy Land, um, uh, etc., but be, being, by the way, much more impressed by, by Rome than Jerusalem, interestingly enough. We were talking about 13th century sources, uh, but surely at the time already... The, given that so many Christians evidently already existed there, um, would, would be the case. Um, and that it was possible to keep worshipping privately what we call paganism. He just, however, allowed to practice that was, one, the exposure of the infant, so this early practice that, as you know, was present in early, um, you know, in all early cultures, the Norse, Rome, Greece, etc., essentially a genetic selection by leaving exposing an infant to the uh to to the to the weather and definitely you know in uh if you wonder also how populations were selected just know that we humans killed each other to to, to an increment that's also why we evolved the way we did in the last uh so fast um and uh, you know prehistorically and historically um just to have tougher people with, with the specific purpose of having, with improving the race, literally. And the other was eating horse flesh that had been prohibited by the Papas in the 7th century, not much because of the, the issue itself, but because it was connected to certain Germanic pagan practice, um, which at the time was seen as a sort of a political stand of some sort. Um, eventually, when Christianity reinforced in Iceland, these two practices were abandoned as well, but this is how, uh, at the turn of the millennium, the Icelanders decided to uh, to peacefully and for definitely uh, convert to Christianity, while well, maintaining these pagan customs, but essentially making the whole thing flowing smoothly, and that's something that you, you must give an enormous credit to these people for, um, especially at the time. Now, the first Icelandic bishop was Islay for Jusurarsson. Um, he was consecrated by the very famous bishop Adalbert uh, of Hamburg, uh, Bremen, say better, um, that um, was, uh, you know, Papal Legate, right? Uh, one of the most important political figures in the Holy Roman Empire, one of the regions for the same Salian Emperor Henry the the Fourth. We are uh, in 1056, and so this reveals again how important Islefor was um, born in 1006. So he he belonged essentially to the next generation after the, the 
Christianization of Iceland, he died in 1080. And the connection with um, Adalbert of Hamburg is uh, incredibly important because you know that that um, diocese had been historically created um, for the essentially evangelization of the Norse uh, from Germany, and it had initially been destroyed by the Vikings. And the fact that, however, it was of course rebuilt and uh, of course Hamburg developing also as an important city, eventually part of the Anseatic League and so on, having always this connection in the northern with the northern seas is um, a strong evidence of the actual Icelandic connection with the with the empire, with the, the imperial Catholic tradition, uh, etc. Right. Um, so, with the end of the Viking era, uh, the so-called Commonwealth that was reminiscent, as we've seen, of the ancient thing, etc., was becoming obsolete. At least, uh, various uh, Icelandic clans had become so powerful to erode um, the Commonwealth institutions. Right. Th this was essentially a private system, and so as we've seen, the, the central authority was quite weak, and so the way that power would uh, eventually develop was from these various houses that began to sort of extend their control on chunks of, of the island, also on and obviously on behalf of the Norwegian king. Right. Uh, this goes in part. We have seen it in the video about. I mean, made multiple videos about Viking. Uh, warfare, but also Scandinavian warfare in the high late Middle Ages, how the uh, local farmers began ever more subjected to uh, the feudal order, the nobility, the church, as we'll see now very importantly, um, so much so that were not even um, levied much anymore for the usual Leidang naval expeditions uh, that these powers continued doing, but essentially with more professional and select forces, all right, to rot assist. Of course, Mar uh, say, I made a video uh, some time ago about the Scandinavian militiamen, right? And of course, there was, you know, in this north of Europe, of course, and some important um, exposure, at least to, ra to raiding warfare, this idea that an average uh, Norse farmer would was, yes, a bit more... Uh, warlike than the uh, the rest of the say, continental Europe, um, but essentially because there weren't too many structures over his head, and so the the situation locally was more uh, destabilized. Nothing they particularly developed in a strictly military uh, military sense, but uh, still relevant even for certain community associations. Uh, also. Uh, the Norse have a communal tradition, for example, that stem mostly from the union of rural villages that were trying to impose themselves on one another, and so get this recognition of uh, town rights, even though they were just sort of rural villages scattered, even just not even a single centers, um, to, to for for the local elite to be co-opted, etc. In any case, there was a handful of families. Um, with their leaders ruling in Iceland by the, the end of the of the 12th century, and uh, in general, the period stretching from, in fact, the beginning of the 13th century to 1262, is known as the age of the Sturlungs or Sturlung era. It was actually a, a pretty violent time, uh, witnessing the, in fact, the the struggle between the various Gothar, that is, the chieftains. Um, that brought also for the first time in, in Icelandic history those several hundred of participants to their warfare. Now, Icelandic warfare, we'll make surely a bit about this at some point, was uh, was interesting because apparently there was less... Um, it was truly reminiscent of still even a... even not Viking, but even migration-era warfare, right? Few, relatively few cavalry, rel relatively few uh, missile warfare, but this bands, right, of hundreds of men just beating the hell out of each other, but fundamentally just as their leaders that fought in front ranks killed one another because of their feuds, um, the, the, the rest of the followers would simply drive home and um, uh, there wasn't even that capacity of pursuing or, you know, n or needing that sort of elimination. They were, as communities, also reliant on one another. 
and they would seek to 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 get this over with uh uh, just like in traditional, I mean, Germanic law, right? Um, the feud is, the, the vendetta the, is, is perfectly um, illicit uh, but because the the damage has to be recompensated as soon as possible because the most important thing is to remain politically cohesive. So if I kill a guy from your group, you kill one of mine, we're done. We're, it's okay. It's morally accepted. Um, at, at Similia, right? Naturally, by the 13th century, Things were not even so romantic. What is stressed here is, of course, the the, the primitiveness of, of Iceland as such. But as we see also from some beautiful, uh, for example, the Reykjavik um, pan door wood panels that I inserted here show. I made a video about Scandinavian warfare during this period in general. The uh, chivalric equipment that naturally had always been around uh, from the migration era, the Vandal era. Um, the Norse had fewer cavalry because they had less surplus, um, and especially they had not the, that level of collective cohesion, right? But individually speaking, they were absolutely obsessed in the most radically violent imperial Catholic ideal of the, the hero that has to roam the world and sort of controlling it and growing with that, and it, he's always represented on horseback, fascinatingly enough. Maybe Norway, yes, was also the... Uh, the place in Scandinavia with less um, equestrian development and Iceland maybe because of that uh, even lesser surplus was exactly not the place of cavalry but still it was there and you have to imagine even the say the most affluent of the Sturlungs having some very fine continental European panoplies uh, maybe with some anachronism, with some pieces missing, or with some some s strange material, um, cheaper material, but still very much like the, the rest um, of Europe. And this, this is fascinating. It, like, just we were talking about the Berna Norse warfare, you know, how shockingly primitive, like, I don't know, Gaelic warfare remained until even the, the 17th century. I mean, literally, they were fighting, just chopping themselves to pieces with swords. Uh, even though they knew how to use muskets, etc., but they didn't have the, the structure to do that unless they were hired by some other power. Uh, at home, they would still live in a medieval fashion, even an older one, uh, to some degree. And Iceland was not that different, telling the truth. Um, the Sturlungs are specifically the most powerful clan around, um, that is, um, the one of Sturla... Um, Tartarson and his sons that are Sigvatar Sturluson um, uh, and uh, and the famous Snorri Sturluson these were in the full you see the 13th centuries, the peak of feudalism, of chivalric ideas these, these were all skaldic poets, right? we all thank Snorri for the extreme um, of course uh, unspeakably important civilizational task of putting um, uh, down Parts of the Edda in, in prose, um, the uh, the Heimskringla, the Inglinga saga, etc. Uh, um, also, we we're not sure about Egil's saga. We, we, we talk about that. We read from it um, for the battle, Burnham Burr, etc. But as you know, um, we're talking about one of the major literary, even historical, poetical, and political figures, actually, of 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 13th century Europe. These guys were leaders, fighters, poets, right? Like the older, um, truly wisdom, the sort of Odinic uh, ideal of the same power, right? The, um, the, 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 the ancient Carmina of, uh, connected with the, the Sal. The, the, you see, every, every culture at that point, just Europeans arrived to this at uh, different times, and, you, and we have... Of course, this incredible luck of having had uh, so much sagas eventually written down. We had all the problems in the process because they were truly another thing. They were an oral tradition, but for those who complain about, ah, oh, but these were written down in Christian times, whatever, we still know pretty well how to read through that, right? So there is no conspiracy work at play. Uh, what we know is that the authors, uh, I mean, even just of those wrote these things down the way they, they did so that they were extremely smart people right and incredibly intelligent people nobody today would be able to do uh, with even with technology the type of work that they were doing 
uh, and we're all extremely uh, thankful for that. But just like in the age of the Minna's anger, etc., what you realize is the peak of male uh, creativity is also the peak of male violence. Right? These were people provided with the single most beautifully sensitive poetical feelings, but that could cut people down to pieces on a regular basis, uh, which was completely normal in their uh, in their environment. Um, in fact, um, this is the point, right? The uh, at least the Sturluson were the main of the, the the two clans that were struggling over uh, the control of Iceland, uh, which was a conflict very much, um, in fact, rooted in the uh, Sturlung's connection with the Norwegian monarchy, which was not so simply, uh, say, faithful uh, as such. Of course, the Sturlungs wanted something in exchange. The same Norwegians didn't have this enormous grip on their own monarchy. But they had enough power to, of course, influence Iceland and sort of maintain a control, a tribute, etc. These guys, the same Norway, went back and forth from Norway to, to Iceland, etc. Um, and uh, that's where the average Icelandic farmer is basically becoming subject in a feudal sense to these greater lords that uh, into whom the, the entire production basically of, of this of, of the community flows into. Like in, you know, all these people working the land for having an actual master covered in iron. Um again, fighting, defending them, protecting them, but also needing this uh this uh, this support. Uh in twelve twenty Snorri Sturluson becomes formerly a vassal of the king Akon the fourth Akonson, which we have also seen at play, really, uh, in the Battle of Larks video, which I recommend if you really want to sense also the uh, the beautiful, um, in fact, very saga-like uh, um, story describing the battle against the Scots. Um, and that was... Again, all one, in fact, with these uh, events, right, of European-wide connection, Norway, Scotland, um, Ireland, Iceland, etc. Snorri's nephew, Sturla uh, Sigvets' son, uh, yet another, in fact, Gauti uh, of the Sturlungar clan, uh, also became a vassal of Akon the Fort of Norway, because it was not so immediate, right? You had to, everything was seen in this Norse dimension still in a very individual, at the personam sort of uh, relation. You had to renovate this um, subjection. And this tells you a lot, of course, uh, about the same Icelandic autonomy um, at the same time, right? Um, this provided, by the way, Sturla with the power to... Uh, fight the other Icelandic clans. Um, together, however, with the increase in Norwegian power over the same country during the 13th century. Basically, the age of the so-called Icelandic Commonwealth ends in 1262 because of the Gamli Sat Mali, that is uh, essentially the old covenant, so-called um, acceptation, right? Agreement to accept the Norwegian sovereignty by the by the Icelanders. This de facto created a union with the Norwegian monarchy that brought um, Iceland uh, under you know Norwegian power until the, the beginning of the, of the 19th century. This also entailed a legislative and um, ex executive power. Um, reform uh, with the adoption of the Jonsbok in 1281. Basically, the Icelanders were providing themselves with ever more, again, centralized government was able to properly police the country, etc. Still, again, compared to what were the the average um, continental devil things in a very autonomous way, but still for from the Icelandic perspective, a big deal for, of a change. Um, there is also um, the so-called Stat, uh, Stat that is the increasing power of the church and especially the uh, struggle over the fights uh, between 
the ecclesiastical institutions and those noble lay noblemen that had actually founded the various church abbeys cloisters etc as a uh, proprietary um, which means that uh, the church was essentially developing to the point of saying that uh, you know the the of course the uh, this was a process that normally was shifting from the early high middle ages or in continental europe but the idea that yes initially founding a a monastery like putting say your your daughter as an abbess was a, an important way to endow your uh, your f- clan with in fact a, a possession that as a monastery in this case was provided with specific privileges exemptions um and uh, you know untouchable uh, freedoms but these were granted by the church and so while everything was very private and there was not enough of a a central power could do such things, but eventually these monasteries, abbeys, etc., would become uh, more important, uh, sort of autonomizing themselves, um, even separating from the the original founders and providing themselves with this um, privileges and um, exemptions that could not quite be infringed uh, upon. Um, the ultimate struggle was won by the church in 1297, which brought, in fact, an increasingly uh, powerful uh, capacity to detach from secular influence. Um, so Iceland witnesses what was happening in many parts of Europe, uh, and especially the ones that, in fact, were sort of more not not states, right? The, the creation of ecclesiastical principalities that would be sort of out there on their own. Many in Iceland, not to this monstrous degree by scale, but still relevant uh, from a local point of view and contributing in part to the, let's say, to the, not necessarily ungovernability, because these ecclesiastical seigneuries were still bringing order to, to their degree, but still carving their own uh, sphere of power, not essentially allowing our powers to infringe upon it again. And, um, in fact, after this, for the rest of the Middle Ages, uh, not much really changes. The same Norwegian royal influence on Iceland consolidated, but gradually. The Norwegians had consistent problems at home you know that the Scandinavian monarchies until the late Middle Ages are not say that the end of the Middle Ages proper are not very solid they have uh, quite severe issues especially uh, with the mid 14th century crisis um, at this point the the clergy profited largely from this because they accumulated a lot of wealth through the tithes ecclesiastical authority in Iceland uh, was felt. You had important bishoprics in Skalold, in the south, at the river Hrita, and Holar uh, in the north. Um, essentially, these ecclesiastical lords came to replace the old chieftains of his Icelandic tradition. Iceland was ever more considered like a Norwegian vassal state, um, except with the mid 14th century crisis. Um, the uh, ties were w- with the mainland were uh, significantly uh, close, right? There was especially a coldening of the climate, known as the Little Ice Age, that did influence um, likely also the spread of the Black Death, etc., and that brought, especially in the north, to the um, essentially um, you know uh, shrinking of the arable areas. Right. This is why, for example, um, Iceland, uh, I mean Greenland, at some at this point was abandoned largely. Also, certain parts of Iceland, like just like continental Europe, went depopulated. Nature sort of came back to to degree. There were uh, shorter growing seasons and colder winters. So, you know, you understand the order you went, the worse this this really was, and Iceland was significantly affected by this. Uh, in the 14th century, the Saracens arrived to to hit the same Iceland, right? It was just, 
you know, on occasion, but just for saying that such things could, could definitely happen. Um, things were worsening definitely for the peasants. There was the so-called Vistarband institution, which was a sort of um, scenery over the over the, the farmers, for which um, the latter would bind themselves to uh, land uh, to the landowners for a year at a time, and it mostly uh, equated, of course, to their loss in power. This again, we, we've seen many times in the 14th century. Actually, the average commoner sinks literally. Uh, the myth that in the later Middle Ages people acquired more freedom is probably the single most, uh, you know, unforgivable mistake that you make. You can't macroscopically make all the, um, uh, you know, in medieval historical preparation. It's the diametrically opposite by no other degree, like measurement. Uh, the peasantry, the, the lower classes, failed in the most clamorous and unappealable way and sunk dramatically throughout all the, the following half of a millennium. Um, and um, this, um, especially with colder climate, um, the, the primary cereal crop, barley, um, was more difficult to, to raise. Livestock at some point... Um, came actually to to be more with I made a video specifically on this uh, uh more a more reliable source of food uh, after all even though you know animals could die because of the frost at some point so the Icelanders had to adapt uh to this and they began also to depend more on continental Europe as they were importing grain for survival um which cost a lot because Iceland really didn't have many resources on its own. Uh, the early settlers had gone there for for the warless thieves or something like that, as some of the most you know, um, you know, lucrative um, goods you, that they could uh, find there. Um, there was a lot of dried codfish um, demand, uh, especially after the crisis, and the 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 Icelanders, if if you want, went even more at sea because of this in order to uh, find more food and engaging in a sort of broader cod trade that existed out there. We are here at the beginning of the age of explorations, as we know. So, I don't know, Columbus, just make an example, had gone to Iceland during his time. I mean, because he was, the Atlantic was becoming part of a broader net, um, and especially also because of Brought this broader crisis that brought to a sort of re-expansion towards also American later times. But um, the most interesting thing politically happening in Scandinavia uh, and affecting Iceland as a consequence was in this period the Kalmar Union. We have seen this as I've made already a video for medieval Sweden, Norway and Denmark. And you know this was essentially um, uh, first of all, a Danish attempt at hegemonization of Scandinavia as a whole. I mean, Denmark had been the, the strongest, the fastest, uh, the earliest growing um, monarchy, and it had managed to um, essentially uh, subject Norway to, to an important degree from an early age, and at this point was especially trying with Sweden, it was bigger and sort of more complicated to control, especially in the interland where there was a lot of issues going on, as you know, with the iron export trade, um, as far as especially the wars against the um, the Germans in the south were, were concerned, Danish interests differing from the Swedish ones. Um, so Iceland in all this remained essentially under Norwegian kingship until 1380. At that point, um, all of the second of Denmark, uh, by dying, extinguished the Norwegian male royal line that had been, again, the, the Kalmar Union was formed in practice because of this, because the, these Scandinavian monarchies had, of course, tried to secure more power, especially in this later medieval period, as dynastically, right, as separating ever more from the lesser elements. Um, in Norway, and thus Iceland at this point, became part of the Kalmar Union along with Sweden and Denmark with Denmark as the dominant power as it 
basically the, the new dynasty started ruling from there. Um, the interesting thing for Iceland at this point is that the Danes were not so interested in, um, let's say, in the Norwegian need to to control so directly Iceland as they had tried to do up to that point. Um, the Norwegians especially wanted Icelandic fish and homespun wool. Uh, and in part this was positive, at least in an autonomistic sense, but this also made Icelandic income drop dramatically, because as we've seen, the Icelanders had began to specialize in this sort of more um, spe in fact, uh, the defined items, because there was a demand for Norway. Now, Denmark shifted the interest, and so the Icelanders uh, lost also the benefits of being connected with Norway to, to some degree. Um, this is also the reason why the uh, Greenland uh, settlement that had already uh, undergone a, a steep decline uh, from the 14th century died out by the end of the Middle Ages. This had begun, as we've seen before, uh, from the late 10th century when the Icelanders had begun also to, to go sort of abroad. And so eventually Iceland would follow the the uh, the monarchic sort of development of Denmark, Norway. And, uh, okay, th this goes beyond, of course, our medieval period, but this is a bit like the picture. I don't know how effective I was in delivering it to you. Of course, there are just some aspects of their history. I hope that if we, we will... I don't know how often Iceland will come you know, up as our, you know, in our random cyclical choice. But, of course, there's going to be something about that. I hope we're going to make also more Norse stuff. And I... Um, well, I'm glad just we made this first video dedicated um, to this country. For today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.